11062. This is contract B. We have a number of people online. Thank you very much for joining us for the live session. Just before I started to record, I asked the question whether there's been much engagement between you. And it's very common, of course, in a first year subject for a few things to happen. The first is that sometimes we have a relatively high attrition rate. So if you're thinking about dropping the unit, please hang in there and do your best. If you need to, by week four is the um, census date, Tuesday, and you could leave without academic um, penalty. But we'd really like to engage with you. So if you are struggling, please let us know and we'll see if we can do something about it. The next thing is that often we see there's not a lot of engagement between students. It's a little different when you're in a bricks and mortar university, you can bump into each other on the way in and form some connections. So one thing that I often do, and I might do this in week four, is flip the model over to you. Now, when I say flip, I mean that term deliberately because in this university, we have a flipped classroom model generally. What that means is that I'm coordinating you, providing you with resources and encouraging you to undertake your own study independently and within a group as much as possible. So even though I do tend to lecture a bit um, and, we, and I am a lecturer, um, it's all intended to be in this flipped model where we encourage you to um, become self-motivated and to a degree self-learning. Now, in the context of flipping that over to you to become a better collective, in week four, I might have the session available and turn it over to you. What that means is I might sit in the background. I may not even tape it. Um, I often don't record these sessions because that way people feel I've got more freedom to have a chat. So it may be that that will occur I'll let you know next week. Last week, I talked to you about mindset and I talked to you about the approach that you might want to adopt in your studies and in your interactions with colleagues and people at the university. I was trying to think of a way of best describing that and I've come up with something that might be relevant to your studies and to law generally. I'm going to ask you to act in a way where you assume that everything is being seen by, say, the Legal Services Commission. That means all of your interactions, your communications, your assessment work, whatever it might be associated with the university, think and act as if it's being, it's being looked at by a governing body. Now, I mentioned the Legal Services Commission because that's the um, body that has jurisdiction to oversee generally the conduct of lawyers in practice. That and the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, um, I'm, and I'm a member in that tribunal. So if you haven't had a look at the LSC website or some decisions from QCAT about disciplinary matters and lawyers and law generally, I encourage you this week to do that just to get a feel for what it is that lawyers are supposed to do. If you haven't looked at the um, Australian Guide to Legal, sorry, if you haven't looked at the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules or the Barrister's Rule, please do that as well. So that's part of you getting a feel for the ethics and what's required of you in law. Another way that you might think about it is this. Anything that you do, write, um, explain any, any of the communications generally, ask yourself, how would I feel if I was presenting this as something that I did under cross-examination in the Queensland Court of Appeal? Would it stand up if someone was saying, well, did you plagiarise that material, etc.? I'm not meaning to scare you, but just try to encourage you to adopt a mindset that you are now essentially part of this legal fraternity, profession if you like, um, through your course of study and take ownership of the fact that you're part of this group and um, you are required to 
hold yourself to a certain standard, which is very important, historically very critical. I hope that makes sense, what I'm trying to do there. Now let's talk more about what we were discussing last week in the substance of the material. Last week we were talking about mistake, we'll continue with that, and we'll talk about unilateral mistake. So what's unilateral mistake? Does anyone want to unmute their microphone and tell me? You can if you want, or you can um, use the chat it's facility. One, one person's yes. mistake, so one person is making the mistake. Exactly. Um, and it's going Unilateral to be an issue one. if you've done Thank it. Thank you very much, purpose. Catherine. Sorry. Sorry. What was that? Um, I said it's going to be an issue if they've done it on purpose. Yes, that's right. So it is a mistake where only one party makes the mistake, but the other party knows or ought to know the mistake is being made. So the example in the notes Maria offers Stephen $200 to tutor in contract. She says, I know you've got a high distinction, so obviously you know what you're doing. Stephen has no idea why she believes he got a high distinction. He got a pass. But he wants the $200 and he agrees to take on the tutoring role. Now, this is a unilateral mistake, isn't it? In the sense that Stephen knows about the mistake and he's the only one that knows about the mistake. And the other party knows or ought to have known that the first party made the mistake. Uh, so Maria made the mistake rather in that instance. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to ask generally if you think that's a pretty clear cut example of unilateral mistake. Are there any issues, any arguments that you might be able to raise if you were trying to defend Stephen's position? Um, you might say that it was her responsibility to know, to actually look that up before she said that. Yeah, that's, I think that's a very good point, given that she was the one that presumably was in the, um, uh, the, the position of having access to that information. Any other arguments that come to mind? So we're getting you to think like lawyers now. So the question is this. Maria had two things in mind. She said, I know you've got a high distinction. That was clearly incorrect. But then she said, so obviously you know what you're doing. Now, if I was arguing for Stephen, I would say we shouldn't focus on whether he got a high distinction or a pass. We should focus on the question of whether he knows what he's doing. And the fact that he passed the subject uh, and has done other study or, you know, has good communication skills is arguments to suggest that he knows what he's doing. So there might be a difference between, what I'm saying is there might be a difference between the statement you have a high distinction and you know what you're doing. One doesn't necessarily match the other. There may be a difference. So it may be that Stephen could resist a breach of contract claim on the basis that while there may have been a unilateral mistake in relation to one aspect of what was said by Maria, there is no mistake, at least in his mind, that he knows what he's doing. Now, I know this is what lawyers do. We try and pick things to pieces. So do you understand what I'm getting at there? And the point that I'm trying to make in a very roundabout way is that when you look at a problem, you use the IRAC methodology in terms of legal reasoning, but ultimately you come up with arguments. And this is the sort of thing you need to start to think about in terms of a mindset for the second assessment, where you look very critically at the facts, you try and apply it to the law, and you think about a few things. You think about, well, am I making any assumptions? Um, are there different ways of looking at this? Is there a different approach? Can the words be interpreted in a different manner? So these are the sorts of things that you need to consider in the study of contract law. And as I said, you certainly need to develop these skills for the second assessment. So how then do you analyze a unilateral mistake problem? How does the law deal with these situations? The first thing is you break down 
the unilateral mistake into one of three categories. Can anyone tell me one of those categories? A mistake as to what? Um, the substance. Yeah, um, we'll take that as the subject matter, the substance, yes. Very good. Anything else? Um, a mistake Renee. as to the other party to the contract. Yes, a mistake as to who you're dealing with. That's good. And what about a third one? Any volunteers? Identity, said um, Stephen, yes. Which is as to the other party. Any other ideas? A mistake as to the nature of the contractual document. Yes, that's right. So they're the three. Um, okay, so mistake as to subject matter. What's the leading case? What's the one that you must refer to in your answer to an assessment problem? Taylor and Johnson. Taylor and Johnson, yes. So Taylor, um, Johnson gave Taylor an option to purchase land. The price was specified. Mrs. Johnson believed it was $15,000 per acre. That was incorrect. It was 15,000 in total. Mrs. Johnson refused to proceed and Taylor sued to perform the contract. When Taylor sued to perform the contract, what was the specific remedy that he sought against Mrs. Johnson? What's the name of the remedy that he sought? I'll give you a hint. It's an equitable remedy. Was it rescission? Say? What's that? Rescission? No. 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 Taylor sued to perform the contract, forcing her to go ahead. We call that specific performance. So it's an equitable remedy um, as opposed to damages. So when you see that term, perform the contract, meaning specifically perform it, specific performance is the remedy we think about. Anyway, despite the clear words on the contract, Mrs. Johnson said, hey, there was a mistake here. And the High Court gave some ideas to the tests that need to be applied before we can say that some, something is subject to unilateral mistake. So the fact that one party feels that there's been a mistake about the subject matter is not enough. The question is, would a reasonable observer come to that same conclusion? And there's a difference, isn't there? Because I might genuinely believe there's a mistake, but someone looking on might say, you might say that you're mistaken, but that's not reasonable for whatever reason it might be. So generally in law, when we're trying to ascertain something like uh, this test of what someone is thinking, we refer to either the subjective test or the objective test. And you'll hear it a lot in different parts of the law. Subjective meaning what this individual actually thought. Objective is what a reasonable person looking on would think in terms of what, what they see. So that's the objective test. So courts um, use an objective test as they often do for this type of um, matter. And courts will distinguish between approaches of common law and equity. So I think we talked about this briefly last week. Common law generally means that which is fairly strictly applied, black letter law, and equity, what's fair, use exercising a discretion. And confusingly enough, all of the cases that deal with disputes between parties is often called the common law. So that term common law is used in a couple of different ways. And annoyingly, this happens in law a bit, I'm sorry. So the court said in Taylor and Johnson, the common law strict approach would be to say, the mistake was irrelevant. Mrs. Johnson didn't take enough care. She must suffer the consequence 
that equity is more aligned to the law of consciousness. And the High Court found that equity allowed Mrs Johnson to rescind the contract. What do we mean by that term rescind? What does that mean? Rescind means to set it aside, to stop it. It's an equitable remedy. Um, because Mrs. Taylor, Mr. Taylor took some deliberate steps from al allowing Mrs. Johnson to become aware of her mistake. So Mr. Taylor actually did something proactively to create the problem or to stop Mrs. Johnson from really understanding or knowing the true position. So in that sense, equity intervened, as we say, in this case of unilateral contract as to the subject matter of the contract. And why did it do it? Because it found three conditions applied. Number one, the mistake did relate to a fundamental matter in the contract. Number two, the other party knew of the mistaken party's mistake. And number three, and this is critically important, this is what made the difference in Taylor and Johnson, the other party must take some step to prevent the mistaken party from learning about their mistake. So when you're applying the law in a problem scenario, bear in mind that usually you'll be applying a statute, some legislation, or some case law. And usually if you're applying case law, there's a leading case. We talk about the leading case. So in this instance, it's Taylor and Johnson. In different scenarios, you'd be applying pieces of legislation. You know, in criminal law, we talk about sections in the criminal code, don't we, um, as being the primary issue. So bear in mind that you're generally either applying statute law or the case law, which is also known as common law, in that broader sense that I've been discussing. And sometimes it's a combination of the two. Now, that third step about the mistaken party um, being prevented from learning about the mistake was sharpened in the case of XCB, Proprietary Limited, against Creative Brands, PTYLTD, and its citation is 2005, VSC 424. What's VSC stand for? Any thoughts? You can unmute your microphone for this one. I'll take a guess. Is it the Victorian Supreme Court? Spot on. Very good. And um, even though we're in Queensland, when it comes to decisions of the Supreme Courts, we consider them from all over Australia. So often you'll see reports from Queensland cited as an authority for something, but don't discount the importance of those Supreme Court decisions from other jurisdictions in Australia. So in XCB and Creative Brands, the court said the other party's conduct must amount to more than simply failing to correct the other's mistake it must amount to an unconscionable effort to prevent the other party from becoming aware of it. So again, we have these shades of gray and that fundamental distinction, um, which relates to unconscionable behavior is something that you'll see again, quite often throughout your study of law. And remember, of course, the fundamentals of contract law and no distinction between a contract and an invitation to treat. Uh, for example, um, I'll give you this example. So let's say you go into a jewellery store and you see a whole ray of, a line of watches and they're all marked $2,000. But there's one in the middle that's marked $200. And you say, I'll have that one that's marked $200. Now, the shopkeeper says, oh, that's a mistake. It should be $2,000. Well, 
um, given that the first person, the customer said, I'll buy it, has there already been a contract signed? Are we, is that dispute really a dispute about unilateral mistake? Or is it about something else? I have to think back to contract A for this. Bridget says just an offer at that stage. And I assume that what you mean there is that the customer was making an offer. Stephen's got the term I was after. What offer to treat or actually invitation to treat was what I was after. So just always bear in mind, even in contract B, that you've got to think about the fundamentals of contract and what is the offer, what is the acceptance. Now, one way of looking at this, which would be wrong, is to say that the price that's advertised is the offer. And when the customer says, I'll have that watch, which you've offered to sell me $200, is the acceptance, that's wrong. The, adver the advertisement is simply the invitation to treat and the customer customer does make the offer. I hope that makes some sense. Right. Now, the second area of unilateral mistake relates to the identity of the other party. And this is fundamentally important, of course, because you might be um, contracting with someone because of their reputation or their skill, or you know the fact that you've worked with them previously, um, or their credit worthiness, a whole range of reasons. And there are two types of mistakes. One where the parties are not face-to-face -face, and the other where the parties are face-to-face. -face. Now, if the mistake is made about the identity of the other party and it's not made face-to-face, -face, the contract typically will be void. What do I mean by void? V-O-I-D. Any thoughts? Uh, void means it's as if the contract was never formed. Exactly. And non-existent, like it didn't exist. And Natalie says you can set it aside, which would be the remedy associated with that void contract. So it's as if it never existed. Technically, if it's void, it never existed. If it's voidable, you can take action to set it aside. So there's a slight difference between void and voidable, where there's an extra step to be taken. But if it's face to face, the presumption is that each of the parties do intend to enter into the contract with the person, as it were, standing in front of them. So again, you've got this other little distinction. And this is where flowcharts can be very useful. And um, I, I, I like the idea of some sort of workbook um, toolkit, if you like. Now, I'm not sure if that was still being offered in Introduction to Law. It was something that I, the second assessment in intro when I took it was prepare a toolkit. It was based on some ideas by Professor Scott Beatty. But the idea is this. When you're reading the law and you're reading, you know, the, the pages in the book, it can all seem, oh, this is all pretty straightforward. This is all pretty straightforward. But I need to caution you about this. Things become very different when you're confronted with a problem where you don't, um, where the examiner doesn't immediately tell you that this is a problem that's based on the content of page 432 of your text. In other words, while you're reading page 432, you might say, oh, this is all pretty straightforward, I've got this. But what I've tried to do tonight is take what might seem to be some fairly basic examples of a particular dispute area of law and say, yes, but you've got to think about other things that might be relevant. And when you're under pressure and you're trying to answer a question, it's having this chart that works for you, flow chart, toolkit, whatever it might be, that you may need to rely upon to give you the right answer. And it means having something that you can break down or bring in from different areas. Now, the third area where there might be a mistake is to the nature of the document. This is not my deed, which in Latin is non est factum. 
So the rule is in Lestrange and Graukob, is the old English case, it's the leading case. 1934, 2KB394. What does KB stand for? Bearing in mind this is an English decision. King's Bench, as opposed to QB, which would be Queen's Bench. So Lestrange and Graukob, 1934, 2 KB, 394. And the basic rule is this. If a person signs a document, they're bound by it, even if they didn't read it properly. And we're familiar with the concept that clauses in a written contract are binding on those people that sign the contract, even where they didn't then say, oh, I didn't read it. I didn't know that clause 37 was there, or I didn't understand clause 42. The basic rule, Lestrange and Graukob, if you sign it, you're bound by it. But as always in law, there's these exceptions and there's different ways of looking at it. And one way that the law dealt with the problem is by introducing this concept of non s factum to say, that is not my deed. And what it means simply is this, that if a person had no concept that they were entering into, for example, a contract, we might then argue that the, the person could say, that was not my deed to enter into a contract. Um, you told me I was signing a receipt um, or I was signing an intention to uh, an expression of interest. You know, do you understand what I'm getting at? So that sort of brings in this whole non s factum. This is not my deed. Mistake is to the nature of the document type argument. And there's always counter arguments and arguments that could be made in these circumstances. But going back to contract A, a basic principle is this. There has to be a meeting of the minds in order to have a contract. And if the parties were never ad idem, a meeting of the minds, then arguably there was no contract at all. Now, the case that you might want to use as authority for this is Petlin and Cullen. That's P-E-T-E-L-I-N against Cullen. It's 1975-132-CLR-355, Petlin and Cullen. What does CLR stand for? Commonwealth Law Reports. Thank you, Christopher. Spot on. Now, Petlin was illiterate in English, had very poor proficiency in spoken English, there was an option, the option had expired. Cullen sought a further option, paid $50. Pepin was told he has to sign the document. He thought it was a receipt, not a contract. He then later refused to sell the land. And the High Court found that the option was not binding on Petlin, and they set out some rules. Number one, the person claiming non s factum must belong to a relevant class. Number two, the claimant must have signed the document in the belief that it was radically different to what it actually was. And number three, at least against innocent parties, the claimant's failure to read and understand the document was not due to carelessness on their behalf. So if you're claiming non s factum, you've got a heavy onus to, bird, um, to, to bear. It, in reality, we probably wouldn't see a pleadings directly on non s factum as the principal argument. What other types of arguments do you think someone could raise if they were being pursued by Cullen, forcing them to go ahead with this contract? Is there anything that comes to mind? There are a few key terms you want to keep in mind. One of them I've mentioned or intention to create legal relations, yes. One I've mentioned tonight is unconscionability. It's a, good, it's a good term to keep in mind. The behavior of the other side is unconscionable. Um, and think about the Australian consumer law, whether that has relevance, and we'll be dealing more with that later. Another potential argument is based 
on Amadio. Has anyone heard of Amadio's case? It's really important. Okay, we'll deal with it later this term, but it is one that you'll definitely need to know. So a relevant class, have a look at that. You know, someone who has some um, difficulty, which is personal to them, and they've got to be not careless. All right, so what are the remedies generally for unilateral mistake? You'll, you'll see that I'm pretty keen on a few things here. Identifying what is the cause of action, what are the key elements, what are the arguments, but then answering this general question, well, what can you do about it? Which is, what is your remedy in law? So what are some of the remedies that might be available when arguing for relief based on unilateral mistake? You'd go to the court and you'd say, here's a unilateral mistake. The court would say, sure, what, what do you want me to do about it? What could the court do? Any thoughts? Contract void, says Natalie, yes, void. So you, and what's that process called of voiding a contract? It's called setting it aside. So you'd ask for it to be set aside. Now at common law, a party may not rely on, rely on their own mistake to void a contract, but in the case of, uni, of, of um, unilateral mistake, equity may treat the contract as voidable, set it aside, rectify the contract. Um, Kieran says specific performance. Yes, if you're the party that's trying to force the issue and force the other one to go ahead, you'd seek specific performance. Alternatively, you'd be asking the court to deny the request for specific performance. So um, one thing that the court might do is treat the contract as voidable, set it aside. Another thing the contract might, the court might do is rectify it. Has anyone heard of rectification of a contract? What does that mean? Is that like implying terms into the contract that both parties may have forgotten? Perhaps, yes. It's kind of altering it to rectify it to the true position. It's pretty rare, but for example, if the contract it was supposed to say 50,000 and it said 5,000, then if everyone agreed it should have been 50, the court may say, well, we're gonna make an order basically declaring it is 50, that's rectification. And another one um, that was alluded to earlier is specific performance. If you're, if you're on the, if you're arguing innocent, um, or unilateral mistake rather, if you're arguing that, then you might be looking to ask the court to refuse the other party's request for specific performance. Now the courts in equity will only set aside a contract in the case of unilateral mistake where there's been some sharp practice, where there's been some unconscionable practice and it, it's um, not conscientious for a party to avail themselves of that legal advantage. So in Taylor and Johnson, the court said there are three elements. Number one, the party enters the contract under a serious mistake or misapprehension. Number two, the other party is aware or had reason to believe that the other party was under that serious mistake or misapprehension. And then there's a third one. And we've alluded to it earlier. That is the other party deliberately sets out to ensure that the first party isn't aware of the existence of that mistake or misapprehension. When you identify a problem as being, let's say correctly, a unilateral mistake problem, then it's pretty easy once you've identified the leading authority, if you've got your notes prepared properly, you got to work your way through it and raise arguments around that. So equity may set aside a contract even if there has not been sharp practice, but it depends on whether it would be conscientious or inequitable to hold the mistaken party to the contract. So, um, all right, and rectification we've talked about. So common mistake. 
John, before you go on, yes, I just ask you a question about the class. Um, there was a reference to class back in here related to the 80 year old lady who actually missigned signed that uh, with the $50. What do they mean by class? That's a really good question because when we're talking about a class of individuals, we're really talking about a group that are disadvantaged. Um, so the relevant class might include people that are unable to read, for example. I mean, for example, if someone is blind or illiterate in English, they will fit within the relevant class. Um, or people that rely on others to explain the document, or people who, for whatever reason, can't understand the nature of the document. For example, someone who's um, subject to an administration order where, where the tribunal um, found that that person lacks capacity. So that's what we mean by relevant class within the context of, say, the non s factum rule. But it's it's fairly tough argument. And that's why I, I suggested that in reality, whilst that may be an argument, you'd probably, with greater force, argue other things under, say, the Australian consumer law. Christopher, does that answer your question? Thank you. All right, so let's go on to common mistake. So the example in the text, Susan tells Eric that if he collects her dry cleaning, she will take him to see the movie Grease. Eric says, yeah, that's fine, collects the dry cleaning, but they find that Grease is no longer playing and neither of them knew that. So common mistake, both parties have made a mistake. And importantly, both parties have made the same mistake. That's what we mean by a common mistake. So what do we do? A simple solution might be to declare the contract void, but would that be fair on Eric? Because he collected the dry cleaning. He did his part of the deal beforehand, didn't he? So if you're trying to work through a common law, sorry, a common mistake problem, What's, um, what's a case that you might consider as relevant? Anyone got an idea? Um, there was the one about bananas on the ship. Yes. I can't think what it's called, but I know that was a common mistake. Like they sold something and they didn't realize that it didn't exist. Yep. I can't remember what they did with it, but that, I just remembered bananas. <laughs> yeah. Look, I might be mistaken on this one, but I think it's the case of Great Peace Shipping. Um, yes, so Gail's got it against Civilaris, Civilaris Salvage, and the citation is 2003 QB, Queen's Bench, 679, and there are five rules set out in that case. Number one, there must be a common assumption, which was wrong. Number two, neither party must have given an undertaking that the circumstances were true. Number three, neither party is responsible for creating the error. Number four, performance must be impossible. And number five, the mistake may be about the subject matter or vital circumstances surrounding the subject matter. So you'll need to catalogue that have it ready to go. Now, if Eric came to you and said, hey, I did this work for Susan. She asked me to go and pick up this dry cleaning. Now she tells me that Greece isn't playing so too bad, so sad. Would you have any arguments to suggest that in reality, even though it looks like there's a common mistake, there may not be a common mistake here? And what would the arguments be? Any thoughts? I guess one is you'd look carefully at the categorization and the third one strikes me as being potentially relevant. Neither party must be responsible for creating the error. Now, I would have thought if Susan goes and says, if you do this, I will take you to this movie, 
that the law might say, well, you should have checked out whether that movie's still playing before you made that offer. You both made the mistake, but you're the one that created the mistake by not doing your homework properly. That's what I would have thought. Um, so in that situation, maybe, arguably, Susan created the mistake. But you get the idea that there's a way of looking at it that's sort of straight down the line. And then there's the legal way of looking at it. How can we use the facts and the law to mount an argument for our client, one way or the other? Now, common mistake has two general categories. Mistake as to the existence of the subject matter, res extincta, or mistake as to the title, res sua. Now, in um, McRae against the Commonwealth Disposals Commission, 1951, 84 CLR 377, there was a problem in that at that stage after World War II, the, the government was looking to call for tenders for companies to purchase things that were lying on the bottom of the ocean. And the Commonwealth Disposals Commission called for tenders for any, anyone who wished to purchase an oil, an oil tanker that was said to be lying off a reef. But the fact is, there was no tanker, there was no reef. So what happens to this contract? And both sides made the same mistake. But the point here is this. Not every instance of the parties making the same mistake will amount at law to a common mistake because of this blame aspect. In this instance, there was no common mistake. The Commonwealth made a mistake, but McRae acted on reliance upon that mistake and reliance on the Commonwealth statement. McRae was entitled to say, well, if you tell me there's an oil tanker and a reef, I'll, I'll believe you, I'll tender for that. Um, so the only mistake the court said here was made by the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth promised to do something it couldn't deliver and therefore, we're not really talking about a common mistake problem. We're really talking about a breach of contract. You have failed to perform a fundamental term of the contract. Therefore, you are liable, presumably in damages. The Commonwealth Disposals Commission was arguing, well, if there's a common mistake here, <laughs> what can you do? You know, what can you do? Everyone just has to walk away. McRae said, no, I want damages. I want some recompense. So do you see the difference between the common mistake and this breach of contract as it was? So going back to our example, was there really a common mistake? Did Susan make a mistake? She promised something to Eric that she couldn't deliver. Therefore, she was in breach of contract. It was a good argument to say she was. Another case that you might want to consider in this context is Leaf against International Galleries, 1952 KB 86. The gallery purchased a painting believing it was from a famous artist, but it was a forgery. Was this common mistake? And the court said no. The court applied the same logic as McRae. The seller contracted to sell a painting by a famous artist. The gallery contracted to buy on that basis, the seller failed to perform, simple as that. It was a case of breach of contract, not a case of common mistake. So Natalie said, but was that a case for common mistake? Yeah, it's under the headings of common mistake, but it's one of those examples that show you the extent of what is a common mistake and what it is, is not a common mistake. So in this instance, the, the remedy was based on the fact that it was not a common mistake. It was argued as being a common mistake, but the court said, no, this is a breach of contract matter. And by that logic, the only times that there could really be a common mistake, which would allow people to get off the hook, 
is where there was something unsaid or undocumented or both parties said or documented the same mistake where one didn't rely on the other. But where we have instances where one party was relying on what the other said, odds are that even though there might be arguments about whether this is a common mistake or not, odds are it's going to be a breach of contract. I hope that makes some sense. Now, the next type of common mistake might relate to mistake as to title. And commonly, there may be a mistake about whether someone owns goods, but it may be that the seller that is purporting to sell these goods doesn't actually own them. And that's where the Latin term nemo dat quod non habit, but known as nemo dat principle, applies. And the principle is you can't give what you do not have. And you'll learn more about this in property law. So I won't worry too much about it now, but the case on nemo dat to consider is Bell and Lever Brothers, 1932 AC, which is Appeal Court, 161, it's English Court of Appeal. I know there's a lot of material. And could I just say, when putting together this unit, um, I had the benefit of looking at a lot of very good material uh, prepared by AJ George and um, Anthony Marinac before her. And I've taken this unit previously as well. So, so I've got some of the material in there. Um, the end result is you've got a lot of material, a lot of reading, a lot of videos. If you're really stuck for time, I guess you'd probably look at what I'm producing now as the priority, but please do not ignore the other material. I've left it in there because it's excellent and I wouldn't do it unless I believed that it really can help you. Now, what are the remedies for common mistake? Well, the two that really come to mind are rescission, it's equitable remedy, and rectification, it's an equitable remedy as well. But as I mentioned, you know, when you're dealing with some of these cases, ultimately, you, what the defendant will successfully argue that it's not a common mistake um, and will ask for damages, or it might be the plaintiff arguing that. Right, the next one is mutual mistake. So when we talk about mutual mistake, here are the key elements. Both parties have made a mistake, but they've made different mistakes. That's what we call a mutual mistake. It's not, it's not a common mistake. Mutually, they've made mistakes, but they're different mistakes. And um, in that instance, in the example that we gave in the text, in the study guide, Carlia believes Antoinette wanted to buy a Latin dress. She's wrong. Antoinette believed Carlia wants to sell the modern ballroom dress. She's wrong. So this is generally a mutual mistake. They've both made mistakes. It's not the same mistake because that'd be a common mistake. They've both made mistakes, but they're different mistakes. Therefore, it's a mutual mistake. So Collins Dictionary defines mutual as you use mutual to describe the situation, feeling or action that is experienced, felt or done by both of two people mentioned but it's not in this instance, this instance the same mistake. It's just that feeling of both having made a mistake. So if both parties are mistaken, then the mistake is mutual and it's a different mistake. All right. Um, gee, it's a lot of material that we're covering, but you're doing well. And I hope you're doing your, keeping up with your reading as well. So, one thing that I do want you to take away from tonight is this thinking of how courts go about resolving disputes. Bridget said next week is even worse. It is too. Courts often use an objective test. So we now know the difference between the objective test and the subjective test. If not, do a little bit of research. And what I'd recommend, put it in your toolkit, is have some description about what is an objective test, what's the case or the legislation that you can rely upon to refer to it. But the basic rule is when considering an objective test, what would a reasonable person conclude when looking at a certain scenario 
or situation. So the other thing is that generally tonight, what we've discussed suggests that if no one is to blame, the courts will make declarations to the effect that there has been a common or mutual or unilateral mistake. And the way in which we determine whether someone is to blame or not is by using the subjective test, asking what a reasonable person would identify in terms of one party being um, uh, acting appropriately or not, etc., or what the other party might think. All right. Um, I do want to start on week two material now. And I know it's very late in week two to start week two material, but you would have noticed the structure of this unit is such that week 11 is not examinable material and week 12 is revision. So I've kind of got two weeks up my sleeve and I do want to use week four as something that I hand over to you. So I will need to pace this, but generally there's a lot of material at the start and I will get behind a bit in terms of the content. What that means is you read ahead, keep reading ahead, don't wait for me, push ahead. And what I say then will hopefully make more sense. As I mentioned last week, there's a lot of material in law. It can be very stressful. People do suffer from sort of feelings of anxiety and uncertainty. Can I cope with this material? So um, please um, make sure that you keep in mind the Student Success Centre. And um, you can email studentsupport at cqu.edu.au or you can contact Student Success Service if you feel that you're becoming overwhelmed and you need some help. Now, I had a question. Um, did the first assessment relate to weeks one and two uh, or three? I think it's only one and two. I don't think estoppel is part of it. I might be corrected because it was a while since I wrote the assessment, I'm sorry. But I think it primarily is weeks one and two. That said, um, I did encourage you, I think last week, to look ahead and look at the whole unit. And if you see something in week 10 remedies dealing with restitution, which we've talked about tonight, that you think is relevant, grab it from week 10 and put it into your assessment. It doesn't have to be, don't think that you're stuck with what's in the study guide. That would actually be a big mistake. Um, when I first started studying law, this was in 1977. I didn't do so well in introduction to law. Um, this is at UQ and it was a full year subject. Didn't do so well at the, at the halfway mark and I went and saw the lecturer. And I said, I'm, 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 you know, I'm providing you with all the material that's in the, in the study guides and out of the textbooks. And yet I'm really not getting the, the mark that I expected. And I got a response that really surprised me. And um, the lecturer said, well, are you reading the cases? I said, well, no, I'm referring to them, but I'm not reading them. And he said, <laughs> he said well, I had to, to tell you this, but those students that are ahead of you, they're actually reading the cases. They're reading the legislation. They're reading textbooks beyond what you've got. They're reading Newsweek and Time to, to keep up to date. So I thought, okay, well, this is, this is a little tougher than I thought. And you have a choice. You can either embrace it which is what I did, and um, or you can say it's all too hard. Now, you can coast through a bit, to be honest, um, if you're really just looking for that pass mark. And I, but I was looking for one of the, you know, I got honours, and I, that's what I was aiming for. So just bear in mind that um, there's no rule that says, this is what I'm trying to say, there's no rule that says you must restrict your answer to the assessment only to what's in the study guide in weeks one and two, you can go outside that to the extent that you want. Um, now, there's another question, and that was, do we, are we issued with revision notes for exams? That's a good question. Generally, no, but I must confess that on the other occasion that I took this unit, I do think I did provide some revision notes, so I might. I'll, I'll say that I might. All right, so any questions so far? All good? 
Um, mine's just about, sorry, I feel like I'm going backwards a bit, um, but with the tutorial question from week one, mm -hmm. like I do, I understand the IRAC, but I'm getting really hung up on, I guess, why is it not just fraud? Like, why is it a contract issue and not a criminal issue? Oh, that's a really good question. And it might be as simple as, at this stage, we're talking to you about contract law, um, but it probably is a fraud issue as well. And I know that's a vague answer, but even though you could identify it as a fraud, that's a different subject. So um, and it's probably just as simple as that. And that's where I, I tried to, to raise that issue that even though you might look at a question and say, this is a common mistake question, bear in mind, it might relate to the elements of contract it might relate to um, misrepresentation or, or some other aspect of contract law. So try not to pigeonhole it. I'm trying not to have you answer questions that draw on information from other units. So keep that in mind. But you're probably right, Catherine. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. I think I'm just being a bit ASD with it. I was like, I can see all of the, the things and the, the things that we're supposed to link to it. I was like, but it's just fraud. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. That's a very good point you make. Thank you. All right. Um, I won't start week two. We've got no time, but can I just um, raise a couple of other general issues? The first is I encourage you to read ahead and I do encourage you to think laterally. I do also encourage you to start forming some associations with each other so that you can form some study groups and help yourself through. And we'll see how we go next week. But in week four, I'll probably hand it over to you. So what that means is, I'd like you to start preparing something that you would say if you were in my position. I know that's a bit vague. I tried it last year and it worked really well. So I might try my luck again this time. When it comes to the assessment pieces, you know the dates that the assessments are due. Please bear in mind that I don't grant extensions readily because asking for an extension and getting an extension is a significant concession. So I need to be fair to everyone. You can ask for a, uh, an extension, but if you do, please ensure that you do so beforehand. But bear in mind, I'm old school and I come from the court system where if your matter is on the 10th of August, and you turn up on the 10th of August and say, I'm sorry, I need an extension because I've been rather busy with other things and I'm not ready to run this trial. You see, just you, you understand what the district court judge will say to you in that situation. So you, you understand where I'm coming from, I hope, with that. So request it, but don't expect necessarily for me to say yes. Bear in mind, if you're late, you lose 5%, but there is a cutoff limit. And part of the reason for that is I want to provide feedback to everyone as quickly as I can. And if I start providing feedback to people and others have got their assessments still outstanding, then it's not really fair, is it? They might see that feedback and that might help them in an unfair manner. So it's a balancing act. I want everyone to try and get their work in on time. And remember, of course, if you get your work in on time, then odds are you'll be better placed to start and complete your next assessment rather than having all these things concertina. Look, I know people have got to go to other commitments. I'll let you go now. Um, have a look at my sample documents under the assessment heading if you haven't already done so to get an idea of how I like you to set things out. So I forget what it's called, but it'll, it'll be in the on Moodle somewhere under assessments. Um, I think it's called my sample document or something like that. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you next week. All the best. Bye now.